and thank all of you for joining us today. It goes without saying that we are still living in uncertain and disruptive times. We're still learning to work differently and we are all continuing to feel isolated. But we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel and we're looking to recovery and moving forward again, which is why I'm thrilled to be introducing this important program brought to you by two of the leading organizations in our industry, Capgemini and HFS Research. This panel will share their expertise with us today as they take us through transforming your business operations by digitally augmenting your workforce. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat or the Q&A feature on your screen. And we will be sending out an email following the webinar that will include both the replay information and a link to access a report that details two of Capgemini's key customers' recent successes in their automation journey. You won't want to miss this. So now, thank you all, and please allow me to introduce the panel moderator, Adam Bujak, Global Head of the Intelligent Automation Practice for Capgemini, who will start us off today. Adam, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Debbie. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. According to Capgemini Research Institute, only 16% of organizations are deploying multiple intelligent automation use cases at scale. For true readers of automation, digitally augmented workforce at scale, combining humans and machines is not anymore a vision, but everyday's reality. The resulting hyperproductivity, breaking organizational silos and profoundly reimagining the way we generate value for clients requires, in my opinion, number one, putting the human in the center and defining the workforce of the future. Number two, looking at the process transformation holistically instead of just plugging in individual automation artifacts. And number three, building all-in-one frictionless technology and data solution that enables profound industrialization at scale. And last but not least, acknowledging the fact that COVID-19 lessons are going to impact the way forward for all organizations and this is in a nutshell the flow of today's session. We're going to touch base on people, process, technology, and data, and discuss the future with you. Let's move on to the next slide. While we are presenting our point of view, we would like you to participate in a small survey on menti.com. To do that, you just need to enter on your mobile phone or PC browser www.menti.com. And once in there, enter the code double five oh one four two visible on the slide as well. You can take a picture or screenshot of it now so that you don't have to remember all the details. And we're going to present the outcome of the survey at the end of our session. Okay, so let us start with the people dimension. Miriam. Where do you see us humans in the digitally augmented workforce context? Sure, thanks Adam. Um, so in one word, we adapt. That's what we always do when change happens. We adapt and then we go on to thrive. Um, so adapting and, and pivoting are, are words that we're using a lot of data FS research at the moment. Um, we need to be able to turn on a dime and avail of new opportunities. And when we explore this um, human and machine um, question with, with people through various questions, we get slightly different answers depending on who we ask and what we ask. So let me start with a conversation that I had with one of your customers when I was writing a point of view about augmenting the workforce that was published earlier this year. So this was a large European paper manufacturer and um, they had a very uh, typical starting point with RPA. So they, they were in the F&A department. There was a huge volume of transactions that they were trying to handle. Um, and there was an awful lot of, of um, obviously automatable steps like copy and paste that, that they wanted to work with. Um, so for them, the shift was very much to move away from uh, processing everything and just start focusing on the exceptions and the error handling instead of the processing itself. Um, and they also, they were very keen to inclu include their employees all the way along, which obviously just helps that whole trust issue uh, work a little smoother. Um, so when we ask people in general, the, the 
data that, that I have on this slide is when we asked people, when we were looking at, um, it was specifically RPA software for a top 10, and we asked them like, what is the benefit that you get um, out of using RPA? What's it helping you drive? And the first answer we get is process efficiency and speed. FTE reduction comes in at number two, but the third answer again, it's back to the process. So when we dig a little deeper and when we ask people about their view on FT reduction, and bear in mind, this is pre-COVID and you know, this is very often business unit owners that, that we're talking with, they're not necessarily saying that they want to take out headcount, not in terms of people right near them in their teams, but they do say things like, well, I don't want to add any more headcount um, and I want to support more growth with a stable resource base, or maybe over time we might ride the attrition wave, which effectively means uh, role elimination or less people doing that type of job over time. So if we move on to the next slide there, when we directly ask a question about role elimination, um, then we get a, a more kind of aggressive answer about uh, intentions to eliminate roles. So consistently across the board, there's very few there, there's very few that we classify as head in the sand. There's a, there's a lot of people saying, yeah, I want to, um, and this is execs that are answering here, I want to reduce a lot of the roles out. And there's some saying, you know, we, we want to, in the next two years, we want to see automation eliminate a lot of roles. So the 21 to 50% and the 50% uh, above showing in there as well. So this effectively means that we've got displacement, right? We've got some people coming out of some roles and then we've got a whole heap of new roles coming in too. And I love to think there'll be loads of really interesting roles and I hope that's not just a, a foolish romantic notion, but I think there'll be lots of really interesting data roles, lots of interesting visualization, storytelling with data, spotting the new opportunities. Because when we look at AI, AI is great at looking at patterns and, and spotting how things have worked in the past and applying that. But what if there's some really new interesting thing happening? I think we'll still need humans that are, you know, good detectives that have creative mindsets to figure out what's the next thing to explore to, to see if that's the, the next wave of something that's going to be really important. Um, so when we think about upskilling, there's, if, if we look at um, the second data point that I have here, we've got what we're classifying as trailblazers and stragglers, and that's according to their financial performance. So those that are ahead in terms of their own financial performance, they pretty much think that they have a skill problem, right? Whereas those that we're classifying as stragglers are saying that they have a will problem. And this is one of the data points that worries me a little bit because I think that effectively means that those who know they have a will problem can't even get the horse over to the, to the water to see if they'll drink it or not. Um, so I think they don't know how bad their skill problem is yet. Um, but I think, you know, the bigger and the harder questions are we know upskilling needs to happen. We know it requires time, energy and investment. So, you know, a, a more interesting question here might be on whose time is that going to happen and on whose dime is that going to happen? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Miriam. Jennifer, how to put the human in the center of transformation? So if you go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about Augmented Workforce, which is one of the programs that we have been embedding into business services, both at our engagement level as well as a practice offering that is taking that question of skilling head on. Uh, this is actually something that I've been ahead of for a number of years in terms of understanding the gap that exists between the will to want to do something um, and the actual resourcing and budget that's required to do it. And when we see intelligent automation, we see that there is this now mass acceleration, even pre-COVID, where we had a lot of enterprises that were uh, gaining traction on including intelligent automation as part of their strategic initiatives. And so with that new uh, acceleration around adoption, we're seeing that uh, the actual resourcing that's available is starting to become a long tail and, and starting to become a problem when we think about scaling new technology across ambitions. Uh, so how we have answered that is by looking at the talent pool that exists currently within an organization and identifying those individuals that you could consider trailblazers, we call them pace setters, that are enabling change within an organization. So as we start to look at, at adopting new digital technologies, not even just intelligent automation, but cloud microservices, and all of the new opportunities that we have to create a hybrid workforce, we know that we need to scale these individuals to not only be able to 
perform the actual development work, but also learn how to work with this new environment where we have digital workers working alongside human workers. So augmented workforce is doing that by, first of all, just profiling the resource, you know, that already sits in your organization. Enterprises today are so talent rich, but they haven't really tapped into that potential because there's a lot of spans and layers across enterprises. And so by having a really good blueprint on how to identify those individuals, that's step one. And then carving out an appropriate curriculum for those individuals that matches the same vision and ambition that the company has in terms of technology adoption, and then actually investing in those individuals to become skilled in those new technologies, and then finding a way to interleave them into the fabric of the operations and the enterprise themselves. If you can go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about some of the key points around uh, implementing an augmented workforce. The first thing that enterprises are typically pretty good at now at this point is establishing their automation strategy. And this is, again, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-COVID. We'll get to the end of our webinar where we talk a little bit about some of the feedback we're getting um, around automation now sort of during COVID and, and, and where we see post-COVID, but right now I'd like to focus on just where we were before that. It's an interesting assessment to, to look at it in both directions. With the establishment of your automation strategy, we know that there is a number of operations and activities that you have earmarked for intelligent automation or even point solutions that are promising straight through processing. So that part has been established. But what we need to do next is we need to look at training those operations teams uh, particularly around creating a strong governance and support system within that organization that can actually manage the training of those individuals to be able to meet the demands of that automation, automation strategy. There will always be a portion of the work that you do that is covered by service providers and in-house development and individuals that would have a very complex set of skills. But with intelligent automation, there's also a subset of that work that can be done by technically pension operations analysts that can actually be trained in something like RPA or DevOps for cloud. So there are a number of ways that we can start augmenting that workforce and creating a new digital worker. So once those individuals are trained, it's now time to infuse those uh, individuals into your operations as a newly skilled augmented staff member. They now have a new role. They now share priorities between their old job and their new job. They now have expected outcomes that are aligned to support that automation strategy. If we go to the next slide, I'll give you a, a case study where this is working very well with one of our financial services clients. So we have about 320 SDE under management. It's actually a managed service that we provide. And those individuals are located in both Mumbai and Zurich. Uh, we, we targeted 20% uh, of the staff as pay setters. So those are the individuals that we identified as uh, good candidates for this program. Right now, we have 33 out of those 60 that are certified in one of the technologies um, across the board that the, this organization is implementing, and that is RPA, machine learning, microservices, and cloud DevOps. Uh, and how we have been able to transform this service is by infusing that skill into the engagement itself at the very ground level. There has been an incredible catharsis across the entire group of individuals that have participated in this program because a lot of these individuals have been doing their same day-to-day -day job for many, many years. And so they've always had sort of a morale issue. We had an attrition issue because there wasn't as much satisfaction or growth in their jobs um, from a day-to-day -day perspective. They saw that change was happening, particularly with the implementation of intelligent automation. And so we wanted to mitigate some of the risk around increasing some of those um, issues around attrition and also decreasing morale by giving the implementation of this skill to those workers directly to actually be a process of that transformation. And what we've seen as an impact is that not only have the phase one certifications been wildly successful, but those individuals are directly contributing to the overall productivity that's planned within that engagement. And they're actually identifying better opportunities for automation than we could because they understand their business so well. We've actually been able to decrease the cost of automation by using that augmented workforce by 30%, and that's actually planned to go to 40% by next year. Our time to value here was only one year for all 60 pay setters to be certified and operational. So this is not a long, long, you know, Odyssey program. This could be done within quarters where you can start to uh, pilot this and, and then send this out in phases so that your individuals are operational and ready and contributing on day one of certification. So I'll turn that back over to you, Adam. 
Thank you very much, Jennifer. Let's move on to the next slide. So we have covered people dimension, and I would like us to now move to the process. Processes ultimately define the value creation for clients, which by the way also addresses the question of Ramesh Krishnamurti, he just posted in the Q&A window. Miriam, where do you see intelligent process automation at scale truly adding value? Right, well, that's absolutely everywhere. So this is another data point from the uh, study that I mentioned earlier, our top 10 on RPA products that went out earlier this year. And the, uh, from top to bottom, we can see that finance and accounting is the one that, that we see like a huge raft of activity here for RPA. And a lot of these are intelligent automation as well. It's not just RPA. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that you can see that across the bottom, there's all the other functions that are mentioned there and a couple of processes um, in each. But where I think there's a massive amount of scope, so I'm going to kind of disagree with my own data here and say where the big opportunity is, is in the industry specific use cases. And we don't see as many of those yet. I think where it's kind of out and about that you can use RPA and intelligent automation and finance accounting and in various other internal functions, um, but I think the possibilities are still pretty endless out there in industry specific cases. Um, so while it's largely untapped, the, the big opportunity here is that these ones can, can start looking toward top line opportunities. Whereas a lot of the other ones here on this slide are, are more about your cost reduction opportunities, but these ones can look toward preventing revenue leakage, you know, on oil, um, oil rigs or um, in water companies or um, they can look at getting more product and service into the hands of, of customers in shorter time frames with reduced effort. Um, and another set of use cases that I'm always particularly fond of and I always shout out when I see them is the data automation use cases because I think there's there's could be some wonderful interplay between RPA and AI with RPA doing some of that awful drudge work that we don't want to have data scientists doing. Um, so um, as AI becomes stronger and stronger, we'll, we'll hopefully see more of um, RPA being its, its buddy here, um, picking up the data from the various different spots that it needs to go find it in and getting it into good shape before AI alg algorithms are run on it, right? Um, so it's, I think what's kind of important at this point to say is that when you wanna make that switch away from how can I reduce costs, how can I reduce costs, to how can I impact the top line, um, it's really hard to do that from within a, a single silo. So that brings me to the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, where um, the other customer of yours that I talked with, they, they had a couple of things going on that made a lot of sense from this perspective. And the first thing that I'll call out, because we're a big fan of this at HFS, is that it was business-led partnering closely with IT. Um, we cannot emphasize enough that this has to be done with IT. There is no point in, in going and learning. Or you'll get so far, but it'll get tricky. Um, so intercontinental hotels, they, they not only ensured that they had critical stakeholders on board from the start, they also set um, a sensible way to, to set themselves pointed in the right direction. So in order to prioritize what they were doing, they looked at some of the kind of usual suspects like cost and quality and revenue and customer satisfaction. But they also looked at their own company strategy and what were the key metrics that they were reporting back to their shareholders on. And they made sure that they kind of lined themselves up aiming toward that. And the other thing that they're extremely clear about was that they wanted people to, to vote that the time that was saved through the automation, um, automation measures. They wanted to devote that to improving underperforming hotels and increasing um, performance in call, call centers. So they're all very top line focused goals to make use of, of any savings made. And that's more important than ever. So on the right, the data point is talking about a question that we asked people last year. We asked enterprise digital leaders, um, are your competitors the same now as they were two years ago? And we have 29% saying no. And when we ask them, will they be the same in another two years, then there's even more saying no. So, you know, if, if we could, you know, shift that focus away from only looking at cost and looking to the core business instead and how we can Im improve the uh, performance and, and revenue component, then that'll be a, a winning move, I feel. I'll hand back to you, Adam. Very insightful. Thank you very much. Uh, people and process dimension moving to the next slide, require a complementing technology and data strategy. So Miriam, uh, 
playing back the question to you. Based on your profound research, how to construct a digital underbelly delivering strong automation impact and predictive insights? So we look at this um, through something that we call the digital one office. And this is um, effectively has both experience and data at its center. So we call it the experience architecture and it's, it's about making the customer experiences and not just customers, you gotta remember the employees and the partners, any human that's dealing with your processes, make them the centerpiece of the strategy. And then the process will adjust accordingly or evolve over time. Um, if we're focusing on taking out friction points, taking out the, the bits that are slowing things down unnecessarily, when we analyze it enough, we'll find opportunities to optimize um, where we can't optimize it anymore, then the, there's opportunities to automate. But if we move forward to the next slide, the reason why this is important is because there's a much more heightened expectation of what um, experiences should be. And that, that's come from um, a lot of very large tech giants that uh, consumers are interacting with on a regular basis and people's expectations are literally to have the same sort of experiences everywhere they go. So um, the more time passes, the more frustrated people are with experiences that feel clunky, that take a long time, that obviously have a lot of gate checks along the way. Um, so the, um, the basis of, of one office is those experiences, customer experiences and um, employee experiences. And what we're terming there as the digital underbelly, it has cloud, secure cloud as that. Um, that's kind of table stakes here. And then digitization and automation of processes. There's, there's loads of different ways this could play out, but if there is any complexity in here, then it should be concealed within this digital underbelly. So those experiences as, as humans are interacting with, with the systems, the main um, driving force here is just to make those smoother, more pleasant and not unnecessarily painful, which is very often the case with a lot of the processes that we encounter today. Um, and there's, there's more with this as well. Like this isn't just about technology because this is, you know, it's got some cultural aspects too. It's, it's about, you know, having an inclusive digital mindset and, and ensuring that people are actually empowered to do their job, to get things done and not constantly getting bogged down in the, um, you know, the approval checks or you know, just, just speeding up anything that can be speeded up along the way. Um, always with some joined up outcomes um, to head toward as well. And once, once data is flowing around a little more freely and um, experiences are a little smoother, then the opportunity to, to get beyond reactive analytics to predictive and pres prescriptive analytics is much better. So, and as I mentioned before, this has got to be IT and uh, business units. It's, no one can go this one alone. But it's, uh, you know, in the absence of something to aim toward, this is a framework where, you know, you can easily kind of work your way through the various components of and say, you know, we could, improve this here um, and get ourselves to, to a better state. Indeed. Uh, let us now move to the practitioner side. Jennifer, how do you construct all-in-one data and technology solutions? So if we can go to, thank you. So I think what's interesting about what Miriam just described with respect to the trajectory of one office, it seems aspirational, I think, for a lot of our companies. And a lot of that is because many of the enterprises that we work with are burdened by a lot of technical and process debt, a lot of silos, a lot of mergers and acquisitions that have happened over many decades. And so chipping away at some of that debt is a little more mon uh, monumentous. Uh, so while one office we think is the absolute future, it's a little bit harder to envision when we think about some of the legacy enterprises. So where we've actually been able to see some solid traction on where the one office could really exist are in incubators such as an interesting entity. They were actually founded in 2015. So we're talking about five years. And in five years, they grew to a multi-billion dollar enterprise. And with that, they have a lot of opportunity to look at their digital underbelly and their operations in a totally new way because they don't have those burdens, yet they still have some great net operating income to be able to make investments on creating that digital operations one office. So we took that lens with and what we did with this particular engagement is we cast an, a simulated digital grid across their entire service placement, across F&A, across HR, across contact center, across manufacturing, across IT. And we looked at every single one of those services and processes in that customer employee partner centric way. And we created a common consistent thread from start to finish. 
and we built a solution across the entire service placement that encompassed not only point solutions that were fit for purpose, best in class, and can grow with the organization, but also weaved intelligent automation throughout that entire grid, looking at the benchmark process of how to do each one of these processes in a best in class way, and then overlaying that technology on top to create a totally digital operation. We actually anticipate being probably the first totally digital, uh, digitally operated uh, organization within the next three years. So some of the key highlights uh, to look at here, we created a 260 page playbook that covered every detail of their transformation from baselining their original process to looking at our digital global enterprise model in terms of benchmarking that process, creating the absolute best in, pro uh, best in class process, process that we could and then implementing augmented workforce and an intelligent automation application across the entire service placement. So we're looking at some of the key outcomes around obviously significant productivity, which is very important, but most importantly, cost avoidance as they grow. It has a lot of ambitions in terms of how they are continuing to grow their business. So we want to be able to, con uh, to constrain the variable costs of their SG&A while they are growing exponentially and continuing to grow. Um, in fact, you know, we, we often um, talk a little bit about it, particularly during COVID. One of the things that I uh, experienced, as many of our consumer packaging companies experienced, was just an explosion in the request for their product. And we also saw a lot of disruptions in supply chain as we started to see a difference in the consumer need versus the commercial need. As we saw a lot of the parks in Florida start closing, we saw in, in the movie theaters as well, we saw a lot of the fountain and commercial need drop, but a tremendous uptick in the supply chain for the consumer market. And so it was around thinking, away, thinking of ways that we could use intelligent automation to be able to accelerate these changes from uh, you know, one business model to another very quickly. And so we used a lot of this ingenuity to help facilitate that. So you can just go to the next slide. So part of how we are, thank you. So part of how we're actually powering that is we created an augmented delivery center that we are powering with AI. And this target operating model has been embedded into the operations and we're actually running side by side within this organization as their transformation engine. So we have created this ecosystem with, to be able to deliver on this promise across all of these operational areas, and it is extraordinary agile response time. So as soon as we see a need, we're able to run it through this engine, simulate what the outcome is, and immediately accelerate the execution. This has been a game changer for this organization. We wish we could do this all the time with a lot of our enterprises. The problem is, is that when we do have all that debt, it becomes a little bit more you know, cumbersome in terms of getting to the same accelerated outcome. But we believe by using this as an example, it would be compelling enough for other organizations to show that there's other ways for them to be more agile, particularly when they are facing changes to their business model that are critical for their success. We have one more. Thank you very much. Let's move on. Oh, yeah. Uh, Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> uh, let's move uh, to, the, to the mentee uh, survey again. So before we go to our final section, a short, short reminder about the interaction. Uh, please post your answers. We want your opinion, and we're going to summarize them at the end of the session. OK, last bit. We have all been confined at home and impacted in several ways. Taking into consideration everything that we went through in the recent weeks, I'd like to hear your opinion on two topics. Number one, how do you see the post-COVID-19 world and what are the most important lessons learned? And number two, what's the way forward? That's Mina. Um, yeah, so we talk a lot about the different phases and I believe our phases are quite similar to um, the phases in terms of how you guys talk about it. So I'll be brief on the phases, but initially there was a, you know, a big scramble just to make sure everybody could work from home, right? So we got grabbed some data in, um, this was early in April, which is only last month, but it's funny how time seems to just to move at a different pace at the moment. So th this was still very much in that initial phase. Lockdown hadn't kicked in um, for very long. Um, and everybody was, was still in that early, early stage of, of reaction. 
So at that point, early April, people were saying that, you know, top of their list, what they needed to be focused on, and similar to uh, what I was talking about with one office, it was cloud and, and uh, cybersecurity. But the other three, interestingly, are, are three that we focus on a lot at, at HFS Research, which is what we call the AAA trifecta of automation analytics and, and artificial intelligence. And then as we move down the options of, of what we propose to people, there seems to be less kind of commitment to wanting to increase spending in other technologies such as IoT 5G, AR, VR. Um, and I think, you know, what it, what it looks like is that the, the stuff that's a bit too new is that people are starting to, to shrink back a little from. So things like blockchain, like people are, there's 11% saying, you know, we're probably going to decrease our movement here. But that worryingly is, is there for AI as well. So I think AI splits across many, many different things. I think those that are more productized or easy to use and more accessible are still good to go. But the, you know, the harder, deeper, customized, um, I guess, riskier stuff is probably um, um, less likely to get that go ahead right now. So there might be a little bit of a pullback from some of the things that just seem a bit too new. But if we look at um, the following slide, where I think some of the really interesting decisions are going to be happening is the item that I've highlighted here, which as you can see further up, again, it's kind of a building block um, perspective. It's, it's, you know, just do that initial whatever needs to be done to make sure that that operations can continue and, and survive the, the madness that the lockdown that the pandemic, you know, gave us, um, uh, forced on everyone. But um, the, the one that I think will lead to the most interesting um, changes at the moment is that people are suddenly open to all sorts of new things. So, you know, it's an ill wind that blows no good. And if the pandemic has something, you know, if there's something good that we can say about it is it seems to have um, opened people up to all sorts of new possibilities. So we're hearing a lot of um, a lot of talk about people being really, really curious about things that they would have said they could never have done before. So that ranges from people who were still saying they couldn't use public cloud to people who kind of tried automation and didn't go so well, but they, 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 things that they had written off either before, before even trying them or had kind of dabbled with a little, they're now back on the table. It's all sorts of things back on the table. Um, but it's, um, it's also proving to be like a really tricky time. And a lot of this is, is as much to do with the macro as anything else. It's, it's tricky to actually kind of seal the deal right now. It's, it's not a good time to be tr trying to get the, the signature on, on the dotted line. Um, but what I believe will happen here over time is that as everybody progresses through the initial things they need to do to keep themselves going, as everybody gets you know, themselves to the maximum cloud uh, capacity that they can and digitizes themselves enough, then they'll be in more of a, um, a position to consider further investment in automation and AI. Um, but that it, right now, I think what they really, really need is a burning platform is, is not quite enough. There needs to be something else as well as the burning platform, right? There needs to be, you know, both an opportunity and a confidence of, of getting to, to safety when you seize that opportunity. So um, I can hand back to you now, Adam. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. At Capgemini, and I, we had 90% of staff working from home on day one of the lockdown in India and managed to move the remaining team home in a really smooth way without Can you elaborate on a broader Capgemini response to COVID-19. Sure. So there's a couple of things that I want to highlight here. Um, first of all, yes, our response, I do want to talk a little bit about that specifically so that you understand that this isn't just lip service in terms of what we are uh, recommending others do or what we're recommending between uh, the actual milestones that happen between active and passive, but also uh, to ensure that you understand that we are also under the same type of unique situations. And there are responses that really do make a difference in terms of what those outcomes are. So let me talk first about, first of all, about the first initial, what I would consider to be the tactical response, and that's just around limiting your disruption. So when we know that we have a bad weather event happening, and this can be attributed to any bad weather event that would uh, in impact business continuity. The first thing that you wanna look at is enabling business continuity on critical business capabilities. 
So in this particular instance, we looked at enabling working from home. And of course, we are recommending that to our clients as well. Because we manage a lot of our clients' core businesses, we wanted to get ahead of that quickly, uh, particularly because we have a disproportionate number of our individuals that work for these clients in India. So we wanted to make sure we got ahead of that. In fact, in February, not only did we start to respond, but as Adam mentioned, we were able to move over 100,000 of our associates to work from home, even in very remote areas of India. In fact, we shipped over 50,000 laptops and over 30,000 Wi-Fi hotspots to enable them to work from home, some of them for the very first time. So it was very important that not only did we uh, create the opportunity, but also support them to ensure that we weren't just putting them into their home without actual access to their work, but we were actually looking at ways of doing both, keeping our workers safe and in appropriate situations, as well as in parallel, making sure that our business capabilities were uh, not reaching for sure. The second uh, point in terms of our keep it moving approach is to ensure that we are restoring and stabilizing. So if there are some of those non mission critical uh, business activities that do go offline during that process, this is when we want to look at restabilizing those. Um, typically, we are looking at staying within our certain SLA timeframes and also looking at the impact if we do uh, go into a delta on those SLAs, but making sure that we have a full definition around what is the best scenario to restart some of those business capabilities, not just looking at rolling everything out at once, but looking at what the priorities are so we don't overwhelm our staff. And then as we are continuing to look at what the relaunch is of a new normal, I don't actually wanna say new normal, I think it's just a staging of a normal for a company in a you know, milestone trajectory of the history of an enterprise, we wanna look at what's the future, right? So how have we um, you know, created resiliency, not only during this process, but what do we need to do that's still a gap in terms of long-term resiliency? Um, in fact, there are a number of uh, components of that that I've been talking with our clients about in terms of what their burning um, issues were during this process and how they're looking at it from not only a, a tactical response, but more strategic response moving forward as they look ahead. Let's go to the next slide. And some of those individually and to also carry on to what uh, Miriam was talking about, there were three specific aspects we looked at in terms of some of the hot topics that, that our clients were either communicating to us or asking our uh, counsel on. And what, of course, the first one was business continuity. So we needed to create stable delivery, particularly of our outsourcing and automation services, which played a key role in uh, maintaining and even increasing our clients' confidence in both our services as well as our virtual delivery services. In fact, uh, how we actually performed in this particular scenario, uh, across the board, increased our net promoter scores um, throughout our client uh, client engagements. So that was a great testament to Capgemini's response. Um, the second one was that, interestingly, some of our clients who are more modern companies um, have progressive vacation policies, and many of those vacation policies were, were acted upon. And so a lot of their key employees took their time off, which some of them were either many, many, many weeks, some of them were 12 weeks long, to completely indefinite, which actually hamstrung those companies in terms of core business operations. So they became a very um, small, uh, very agile organization very quickly because of that. But it also set up a existential question because this is a brand promise to their employees that this is part of their culture. So how are they going to change that in the future? It's still a question to be answered. And then finally, in terms of business continuity, which is very important, and I think on the minds of a lot of individuals, particularly in North America, was the lack of real-time data around capital positions, um, which revealed obvious vulnerabilities in, in cash liquidity for a lot of the organizations um, across the, uh, not only across North America, but across the globe. Not understanding, you know, how they were able to weather storms such as this um, and be able to stress test their cash liquidity and get an understanding of what their run rates are uh, if they were to create you know, a disruptive atmosphere such as this um, really has been something that is uh, not only completely paralyzed some organizations, but has now become a key focus in terms of their resiliency plans. Um, I will just give one other point before we move on to automation and cloud, where there has been an outlier in that, which is in banks. So as many of you know, in 2008, during the financial crisis, um, part of the legislation that was passed, uh, which is Frank, was Frank Dodd in the past, created what we call CCAR, which is stress testing within banks' liquidity. 
So now banks have to stress test their liquidity every single month, and they've had to do this now since 2008. Because of that, they actually were able to stress test this exact event, which they do many times throughout the year, um, and they actually are going to be extremely resilient through this process. So I, I will anticipate seeing something like CCAR in every organization moving forward. So automation and cloud, this is where uh, companies have realized a lot of that technical debt and on-premise applications have really hamstrung them. So the client's plans around adoption of IA and cloud infrastructure have increased substantially, and particularly even in the hardest hit sectors, such as hospitality and manufacturing. So even capital investment such as that did not get carved out. They actually accelerated. Um, however, though we do see acceleration is clear, we, do, uh, we are um, definitely feeling that capital planning has been uh, frozen for quarter two. We do definitely see that they're at odds right now with their aspirations. We do see that this will um, increase in Q3, Q3 and Q4 and, and uh, act as a boomerang in terms of the influx of cash for these investments. And then finally, just a couple of things that we're seeing, which um, are just noteworthy. I don't necessarily think that they're trends, but I think that they were interesting, so I, I included them. In addition to the acceleration of the new, we're also seeing an increased demand for the old. So outsourcing such as lift and shift, just carving out their SG&A as a fixed cost and creating a variable cost to create you know, a better balance sheet is what some of our clients are looking to do. Um, you know, totally irrespective of intelligent automation or transformation or anything else, they just want to change the asset uh, and liabilities. Um, so that's one uh, outcome we're looking at, as well as some of our more radical clients are thinking about taking a lot of those business operations that they had offshored um, back in house, uh, back even in onshore, even in high cost locations. So they're looking at, that, uh, looking at that as a resiliency measure. So just some of the things that we are starting to see and hear and, and discuss with, the, with our clients. Back to you, Adam. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Let us move on to our survey. We have received uh, lots of responses uh, from you. Thank you very much for that. Let's have a look at the answer. Um, we clearly see that finance and accounting uh, seems to be still the leading focus in terms of uh, automation. And uh, it looks like our CFOs uh, would, have, uh, would have been much more excited if they would have seen more digitally augmented workforce. Uh, before pandemic uh, hit them. Uh, this is followed by IT, supply chain, sales and marketing. This is quite interesting. We're slowly moving to the front office. So uh, I think for all of us uh, present in this session, the conclusion is clear. There is a vast array of opportunities we can uh, execute when it comes to bringing in digitally augmented workforce to the game. Let's move on to the next question. Here, uh, we were trying to figure out what do you consider as most critical to address your business outcomes in the long term. I see process mining, that makes sense. Uh, one needs to objectively assess the situation uh, in the process. What is the happy path versus deviations? Do we have to automate all the deviations? Uh, does it justify uh, the business case? Okay, process automation, task automation is clear. Agility in all we do, yes, indeed. AI uh, in terms of recommendations, decision making, okay, unstructured data. Indeed, in the last year, we were primarily focusing on automating the structured piece of data. Account management, probably for the service providers, I completely agree. Data, data is, is, is king. Uh, scaling automation, happy workforce. I like uh, to finish with this one. I think uh, we shall not forget uh, that the people are still our most important asset. And from Capgemini perspective, I can say that uh, for us, the human is in the center when it comes to driving any intelligent uh, automation initiatives. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Now we're going to, to the last bit of our session. Uh, here you see examples of HFS uh, research reports you can, you can access uh, through the website. And I see a couple of questions uh, coming from, from our participants. Uh, let's start with uh, Ramana. What will be change in solutioning for an opportunity in the post-COVID area? Jennifer, what do you think? 
So if I understand your question correctly, uh, what will be changing in the solutioning? I'm thinking about um, how you would be applying the technologies or intelligent automation, if I'm correct in how I'm interpreting, interpreting that. Um, I see it as a few different components, and I don't actually see this technically changing. I think that this is the best practice approach anyway, but we're still going to look at the process itself, how the process interacts with other processes, what it looks like from start to finish from a journey perspective. How does that align to not only the current problems of the organization, but the future aspirations? And then how do we benchmark that against what best in class looks like from how to actually do that process in a manual transactional way, and then what applications exist that are fit for purpose for that application. So if we're thinking about something like um, collections or cash applications, maybe we're looking at something like Romilia, and if there's something that continues to be manual that Romilia doesn't handle, how do we then augment that with other areas of intelligent process automation, such as RPA or machine learning? And then what is the outcome of that, right? So what is the actual outcome of that from all the different value levers that we have, whether that's productivity, cost avoidance, avoidance, resiliency of the organization's business continuity, et cetera. I think that resiliency should um, have always been a, a perspective, but I think that it will probably get a little bit more weighted and measured when we start to look at the priorities. So I think if anything, it may just have a higher aspect of measurement when we start to um, select opportunities. Thank you, Jennifer. There is a question from uh, Sinha93. How to handle the rapid changes in the process via RPA as it takes a long turnaround time to do the changes in developing bots? Let me take this one. First of all, I would ask myself, was RPA the right choice? Uh, we see uh, very frequently that uh, deployment of technology, of integration initiatives uh, tend to be much more successful. Uh, for instance, service, service now automations. You can build RPA uh, around that, or you can use embedded uh, automation components, uh, which then are not necessarily affected when you're, uh, when you're applying changes to, uh, to your process. Or you can invest a little bit more into agility and resilience of the RPA solutions, and obviously you know, you're getting faster on that one. Moving uh, to the second question of Ramesh, uh, Thank you very much for answering uh, my first question regarding business case. So this is for you, Jennifer. Do you track RPA implementation and its associated impact to technical debt? How do you ensure implementation does not become an additional burden mm -hmm. to the enterprise? That's a great question. And I would actually um, echo the exact same thing that Adam said. The first thing we would ask is RPA is the right choice. Is it, is it the right uh, opportunity to use RPA? So there are a lot of other options for us to be able to extract data and for us to move data, whether that's through data lakes or whether that's through APIs or web, uh, web calls, et cetera, particularly um, on cloud that we would want to use rather than RPA. We would look at RPA as being the necessary technology when no other technologies exist, particularly RPA. I'm not talking just about intelligent automation. I'm talking about RPA itself. RPA to me should be a temporary worker it should not be a long-term solution. It should only be there to fill a specific need until something long-term and more stable comes along. So that's the way we look at it just with any client when it comes to technical debt and assessing whether or not that's the right solution. Great answer, thank you very much. Last question comes from uh, Shapan. Only cash-rich organization may be willing and able to actually spend on RPA or AI solutions given the current amount of loss most businesses are facing. Do you think this may reduce the RPA market in the short term, which means two to three years until economy bounces back? Well, uh, Shapan, I have to say I would disagree. It is up to the providers uh, to find out a solution. You can always delay the payments. You can make it uh, outcome dependent. So I'm not sure one needs to pay immediately. And uh, this is a joint challenge to the buyer and supplier to find out a solution that is not deteriorating the cash position of, uh, of the organization that is deploying it. No, okay. I'd agree with that, Adam, but you know, there's, there's a, if there's a clear route to value, I think things will proceed. Um, and yeah, there's all sorts of creative ways that a, a deal can be put together these days, isn't there? Yeah, and we see actually an increase of automation demand at the moment. Many, many organizations have stabilized. 
uh, already and uh, and the demand is growing. I'm not talking only about about company companies from the life science sector that are benefiting uh, to some extent from from the current situation. Uh, we believe that the growth will be there and uh, there's nothing that will stop automation. It's quite obvious. And having said that, I would like to uh, close the session with our last slide. Uh, you're going to uh, receive uh, an email which allows you to download a free copy of the HFS research executed jointly with Capgemini. And we would like to sincerely thank you for your participation and are looking forward to interacting with you in the near future. Goodbye. <laughs>